welcome to um, our 10 for North Carolina event on investigative reporting. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Angie Newsom. I'm the executive director of Carolina Public Press. And I'm so excited about this event, getting to talk with these amazing panelists and with all of you um, for the next hour. So thanks, again, thanks so much for joining us. And I'm just going to take us uh, real quickly around what, about what you can expect today um, during our event, and um, we'll get straight to it. We, an hour passes very quickly, we found. So for those of you who don't know Carolina Public Press or might be getting to know us, um, we are an in-depth and investigative news organization, a nonprofit news organization based in North Carolina. And uh, we've been doing nonprofit, or excuse me, nonpartisan investigative reporting for 10 years. So uh, this event is part of our 10 for North Carolina series, which is helping us celebrate the first decade of Carolina public press and the work that we're doing in North Carolina. So thanks so much for um, joining and helping us celebrate. It's it's really terrific to have all of you on. And you've a lot of you have submitted some really amazing questions already. So we're, we're excited for the conversation. Um, so this is our fifth event. As I said, we started talking um, about news deserts and ghost newspapers. We've done an event on the Violence Against Women Act, one on business, um, kind of in the COVID climate. Um, and our last one was on literary North Carolina. So if you're interested in any of those topics, you can find the recordings of those events at carolinapublicpress.org. Uh, we have another one coming up in September 22nd about climate change in the coast of North Carolina. So that's called Changing Tides and kind of follows um, a big series that we're publishing this week about that topic. So I hope you'll join us at that one too, if you're interested. So um, today we're asking that all of y'all stay muted and your video off, but please utilize the chat. The past events have been really active. People have um, shared information with one another via chat um, and asked questions. The Carolina Public Press team is, is monitoring that chat and will be sending questions to me that I'll get to our panelists. So please do, please participate. It's, it's more fun for everybody if y'all are jumping in and, and participating. But please do stay muted and keep your video off. That's going to help us um, kind of navigate the next hour um, in this conversation. So again, thank you so much for participating and being a part of this. We really want to thank Asheville Buncombe Technical Community College for sponsoring this event and others during this series. So thank you so much, AB Tech. And thanks to those of you who are members of Carolina Public Press and help support investigative and in-depth reporting in North Carolina. Uh, we're a nonprofit and all of that really helps us. So thank you so much. It really, we really appreciate it. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our panelists and we're gonna get going. Um, I'd like to introduce all of you to Kate Martin. Kate, could you say hello? Hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our talk. Yeah. Um, so Kate is the lead investigative reporter for Carolina Public Press, and she's been a journalist for more than 15 years covering topics including education, government, and business. She joined our team after five years at the, uh, in Tacoma at the News Tribune, where she reported on the police department's use of mass cell phone surveillance equipment without explaining the devices to judges. So since Kate's been at CPP, she's done some really amazing and tremendous reporting about the prosecutions of sexual assault in North Carolina, um, about the um, about children and, and uh, DSS system, about jail conditions and more. Um, her work has led to the creation of five state laws and the resignation of four elected officials. Right now, her work has um, helped um, lift up some amendments to the Violence Against Women Act, which could have federal impact if, if that's passed. So we're really proud to work with Kate personally and happy that she's on this panel. Um, then we have Joe Neff. Um, Joe, would you like to say hello? Hello, everyone. So Joe is in Durham, North Carolina, and he's an investigative reporter with the Marshall Project, who also has worked with the uh, News and Observer in Raleigh and the Associated Press. He was a Pulitzer finalist and has won awards, including the Goldsmith Prize, uh, the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, the Mali National Journalism Prize, the Society of Professional Journalists Sigma Delta Chi Award, and others. 
He was also a John S. Knight Fellow at Stanford University. And we're really happy to have you, Joe. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. um, next, we have Ron Nixon. Uh, Ron, would you like to say hello? Hi, everybody. Ron uh, is the Global Investigations Editor at the Associated Press, where he oversees the news agency's investigative unit. Um, he's received the inaugural 2021 News Leader of the Year Award from the News Leaders Associations. Um, he has overseen investigations that have won a number of national and international awards, including a Pulitzer finalist in investigative reporting, and just like 25,000 other awards. <laughs> I can have spent a lot of time reading through all of them. Um, he is the author of the book Selling Apartheid, Apartheid South Africa's Global Pan Propaganda War. Excuse me, Ron, I stumbled through that. Um, and he's also a co-founder of the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting, a news trade organization with a mission of increasing the ranks, retention, and profile of reporters and editors of color in the field of investigative reporting. We're really happy to have you, Ron. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And we also have Mara Shallop. Uh, Mara is ProPublica's South Editor, overseeing a team of six investigative journalists covering Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, and the Carolinas. Mara, do you want to say hello? Hey, y'all. Um, prior to joining ProPublica, she served as Deputy Editor of Atlanta Magazine and Editor-in-Chief editor of LA Weekly, the Chicago Reader, and the Atlanta Alt-Weekly Creative Loafing. She's the author of BMF, The Rise and Fall of Big Meech and the Black Mafia Family. Thanks so much for being here, Mara, Ron, Kate, and Joe. I'm excited to talk to all of you. So let's get to it. Um, you know, we had a lot of great questions that came in, as I mentioned. Um, one was, what is investigative reporting? And I'm just going to answer that so we can get on to the juicy stuff, <laughs> as it were. Um, so for us and our organization, and you all can add to this too, we really view investigative reporting as focusing on the people and institutions of power. Um, and ultimately unveiling secrets, exposing injustice, malfeasance, corruption, wrongdoing, crime. Um, and ultimately this type of reporting takes a long time to do and it often requires a lot of um, spe specific journalism skills. So Ron, I wondered if you would kind of jump off, uh, jump us off and talk a little bit about why you do this work, how you do this work, and then we'll kind of spread out the conversation among all of you. Oh, um, okay, you did say Ron. I'm yes, just... I did, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, actually, I was a music major in college, and, and so got into journalism accidentally, but um, just to make a long story short, the first story that I ever did um, just had such an impact uh, that was an investigation, uh, led to a cop going to jail, uh, and it was the very first thing that I, I, I did, and, and um, that was like a you know, real investigation. And I just saw the impact on, even though at the time I hated it because I got a summons to appear in court to reveal my source. And I didn't go to journalism school. So I didn't know you weren't supposed to like tell. So my editor was like, no, we don't do, no, we don't do that. We, we go to jail. And I was like, dude, jail, like <laughs> that real jail. And he was like, yeah, we go to jail. We don't do. So, you know, I, I hated it and actually threatened to resign because I did not want to like be threatened with jail every time I did a story, um, which is not what happens, by the way. Um, but it just showed me the power of, of what investigative reporting and accountability reporting could, could do. And I, I've just um, found that it's, it's, for a society to, to function, it needs a, a fully engaged watchdog press. Uh, and, and I'll just say, if you think about a lot of the things that have happened, if you look at the core of them, you'll probably see that it, it goes back to some reporting by some enterprising reporter uh, on the local, state, or even national level. Uh, and it just think about all the things that would have happened had the press not been there. 
Yeah, excellent. Um, Joe, Kate, Mike. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to jump in on that. I I, I agree with your your definition, but I. Um, uh, but I would say that one thing is that it doesn't have to be a long project with, you know, multi-part and deep digging. I mean, that's really important and those are wonderful. But I think I think of investigative reporting as more of a mindset yeah. that there's something out there that the public needs to know, that the, uh, the people or the institution in charge don't want you to know. And yeah. if we don't get it out there, it's going to stay secret. And so right. I think that it's it's the mindset, and it could be just a two paragraph something from the county commissioner meeting, you know, and it'll it, it can cause a ruckus or a fuss, and things will change. So, yeah, yeah, good point, good point, Joe. Why do you do this work, Joe? Wait, what made you get involved? Well, I got involved in uh, as a reporter more in, towards like a policy and just chasing the news. I was an AP reporter. That was really fun. And then I just uh, started realizing the, the fun stories were the ones that people didn't want told. And I think uh, it's like a puzzle. Like how, how what is the story? How do we get it? And so I kind of really like that, that uh, yeah, the puzzle, crossword puzzle or whatever, um, trying to to figure out how to tell it. That, that's just a fun mental exercise for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mara, what about you? You know, I spent so much of my early career at these underdog publications that were the alt weeklies, right? And I had started at a daily at the Macon Telegraph for a couple of years before that and loved the, the work there, but I just fell in love with what I saw to be giving voice to people who were oppressed or were voiceless. And so, you know, these people who feel like they are helpless to stand up against policies or in a lot of cases, apathy of whatever, um, you know, higher power is affecting their lives in, in ways that were untenable. Um, I just got very into the plight of people in that way and um, spent a lot of time seeking out those who were not often in any newspaper. And that is a challenge in and of itself because I felt an obligation to not um, exploit trust or to like allow them to better understand uh, my intents and what I can and can't do um, as a journalist. And I think I don't expect that even um, people who are have lots of resources understand that, but people who don't have as many resources don't understand media. And so it was partly like an education of the people I was trying to reach and whose stories I thought were important to air to show the ways in which they were being um, ostracized or, or worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are some good points. That certainly, um, you know, Kate, you've done a lot of work along those same lines. Why, why are you doing this? Well, I got involved in investigative journalism a few years after I started as a reporter. When I was an education reporter, I noticed there was a school district that was um, spending things in odd ways and choosing not to spend money on things that seemed to be like a clear thing they ought to spend money on, like energy upgrades to save money. And, you know, after a year and a half, I found out that the school board had bought some farmland for $10,000 an acre when it's only valued at $1,000 an acre with an interest only loan with money they didn't have. And if they didn't, and the, and, the, and the principal was starting to come due. And if they didn't get the money from the taxpayers, they would have had to dissolve into the surrounding districts. And they had a, a football stadium that was big enough to fit the entire town. Like this was their entire identity. And so I started digging into why did they make these decisions and three school board members ended up resigning. And they, I mean, they ended up digging themselves out of this hole, but I was just like, wow, I can't believe all three of these people resigned because I started writing these stories and nobody knew anything about it. Like they weren't talking about it in meetings. They made a lot of decisions behind closed doors. And so I was like, you know, really jazzed up and lots of adrenaline. And I was like, gosh, I got to do more of this. This is a lot of fun. So that's really how I got into investigative reporting. Um, in terms of the amount of time it takes, like when you're working at a daily newspaper and you have to write sometimes two stories a day, you've really got to manage your calendar. And I was always trying to make it a goal to have at least two to four sort of big investigations and to Joe's point like it doesn't have to be a, a four-part series you could just work on one story but it might take you a few months to do that. 
Yeah, and you know, we we really kind of centered this panel and this conversation around, about investigative reporting in the South, regionally speaking. And a lot of you have worked in other locations, um, and certainly we don't want to, and we're not interested in promoting kind of any kind of Southern trope or stereotype. Or stereotype. There's plenty of that out there. Um, but at the same time, we really want to talk about and have an honest conversation about um, the challenges and opportunities y'all see in this region. Um, Kay, I'd like to start with you. Um, I did mention that you came from Washington most recently. Um, what, what do you see that's kind of different um, with your reporting here? Any challenges or um, special opportunities that you've seen? And y'all, everybody else just jump in. Well, I'm coming on three years being in North Carolina, so I may not have the most uh, accurate view but one thing I started noticing immediately is when I would file records requests and I would get turned down, um, they were super polite about it, like in their rejection, even if they were wrong, but they would be, they would like call me sometimes like, oh, honey, you can't have this and the honeys and stuff. Like, I'm not taking offense to that because I'm, I, I get it's like a Southern thing or whatever, but um, they're, they're just really polite and I just have to kind of engage with them in a back and forth and, you know, well, I don't really want to bring our lawyer into this, but this is what the law says. And so that's, that's the first thing I noticed. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? You know, I found being in cities outside of the South for like seven years, but spending 15 years of my career in the South, um, that there's, as we all, as you alluded to, Angie, there's misperceptions about what the South is outside of the South. Sometimes there's misperceptions about what the South is within the South. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, um, so the unit I run is new. It just launched this year. ProPublica decided last year that the region is obviously an essential reason, region for many reasons um, when it comes to investigative and accountability journalism and um, ProPublica had done wonderful work in the South without having a presence in the South. And, and I'm not gonna um, suggest that a, a great journalist can't come into a region and understand it. But I think it was wise on their part, not just because I got a job out of it, to invest in um, people being in the South and of the South uh, and living in the South and sending their kids to school and the communities are writing about um, to be covering the region. And so this is like the, I think, fourth of these regional efforts on the part of the, um, the nonprofit that I work for. And I think um, it just, it does a service to uh, Southern journalism, I'll say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how about you, Joe? Have you noticed anything special? Uh, well, I, I moved from New York. And so this, uh, it was a little bit of a shock, the, you know, the, what um, Kate mentioned about the very polite and, and, and kind uh, interactions with people. And I felt it was slow uh, at the beginning as impatient, but then I think that what I have found uh, in going reporting around North Carolina, I've spent a lot of time in Mississippi the past couple of years is how uh, one of my favorite things about reporting here is just knocking on people's doors. And uh, I know I'm kind of parachuting into their world. And sometimes uh, the subjects are pretty intense. But I just, I just really like the way that uh, most of the time uh, the, the doors are wide open and I get these amazing stories uh, from people. The other thing that was really uh, curious to me was that as coming from the north I didn't realize until I moved to the south that I was a Yankee I lived my whole life uh, not knowing that and and I moved down here and all of a sudden I'm being called a Yankee all the time if people refer me you know it's a Yankee at the front door or whatever <laughs> um, but the and I don't I don't know I don't want to take this too far but I have to say I've never been called in all this time in the South, I've never been called a Yankee uh, by an African-American person. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Ron, how about you? You certainly have a global perspective. Um, 
from your position at the AP, but I, I'm kind of curious if there's um, something that you've seen that makes the South notable in your work. Well, so a couple of things. One, I am a Southerner. <clears throat> um, and so I'm from, I can't even say a small town because it's not a town. I'm from a small community in Mississippi of about 442 people. Uh, I'm sorry, we got four people in the recent census of 446 people. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. As long as there's growth, we are good. Right. So I'm from Lauderdale, Mississippi in East Mississippi. Uh, and, and so I, so a couple of things. I think there isn't anything that is unique about the South that isn't unique to other regions of the okay. country. I think all these other regions have their quirks and weirdness as well. Uh, and they also have their, you know, just normalcy. Um, I do think there are misperceptions about the South, starting with what is the South. Mm -hmm. um, and that, um, and that this, even within states, like I, you know, early in my career, I lived in North Carolina, right? You know, the, the triangle is much different from like Eastern North Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. and, and from Western North Carolina, and it, even from the triad, it's, it's different, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the Queen City, Charlotte, it's, it's, so there are like different things. And then they're like, I saw this really egreg egregious reporting um, about the, and this is just not even investigative reporting, just reporting about, you know, all of these uh, Black mayors that were elected in the South, um, you know, before the 2020 election, but and they were talking about these these progressives, black mayors, and attributing it to like how these guys are winning in like these traditionally red states, right? And the the places that they were talking about were like Birmingham and Jackson, and I think there was a, there was some other state. And then you're like, but they all replace black mayors who replace black mayors who mm -hmm. replace black mayors. There's always been black mayors there. It's like, it, this is not unusual. Right. So it was just, you know, stuff like that, that is just really like lazy reporting because like my home state of Mississippi, the black population there is nearly 40%. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it's got the state, I believe, it, I don't know if that's the highest number of black elected officials, but it's one of the highest. Um, so, you know, there, there are things like that that I think are misperceptions about the South. In terms of investigative reporting though, I don't find it to be any different than, you know, I find a state like Pennsylvania to actually be hard because of the laws, the FOIA laws there than I do in a state like Florida, for instance, where you can get almost anything. You can get people's like, you know, pin numbers mm -hmm. in Florida. <laughs> yeah. you know? So, uh, so I don't, again, I, I think there, the South is not any different than say other regions, even though historically because of, you know, the civil war and the Confederacy, but not all Southern states were in the Confederacy mm -hmm. either. And, and like, you know, there are Southern states like Maryland, like where I live now, who like to pretend that it's not a Southern state, but it actually is a Southern state. You know, there's states like Kentucky and West Virginia that weren't part of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's, it's just, I guess, getting a basic knowledge about the place where you're covering rather than resorting to, to stereotypes. And again, that goes beyond investigative reporting, but yeah. I think should inform investigative reporting. Yeah, and to follow up on that, Ron, um, and you mentioned, you know, had two great examples of the difference in access to public records from Florida to Pennsylvania. Um, I'd love to talk with y'all a little bit about that because it, from the investigative reporting point of view, that's a lot of, not, I mean, that's a significant task that we take on as investigative reporters is getting this public, getting that public information, getting that, you know, keeping or going, making sure government is open. Um, and certainly in North Carolina, it's very different from Florida. Um, so I would love to hear what kind of 
challenges you all have in terms of accessing public information. And Kate, you referenced it a little bit about kind of the responses that you get. Um, and certainly you can talk, Kate, very locally about the inconsistencies um, that's within our state of North Carolina. But Rod, I'd love to hear about that, just like from your experience in public records, or even your thoughts about it. Um, because certainly Florida is lifted up as the best or one of the best in the in the country in terms of access to public information, but also in our region we have some of the worst. Um, so it's it's it, I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I I think that um, you know because AP has like this this national footprint, like we deal with FOIA's in all of these states, and actually we we have a national project that we're working on now where we filed FOIA's in all fifty states. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's two things. One, I think it's the laws because I think a lot of Southern states were, well, not a lot, but some of the Southern states were first to change the laws to say you had to be from that state to like file a FOIA in mm -hmm. that state, um, which I think is, is problematic because, you know, the reporting doesn't stop at borders, right? right. You know, uh, North and South Carolina are like, in South Carolina and Georgia are like right next to each other. So, you know, what happens in one state affects what happens in the other state. So I think that's that's one thing, even though, again, that's not unique to the South, but it, it did start with several states here in the South saying that you had to like be part of that, from that state in order to file FOIAs in that state. Uh, and that, that present somewhat of a barrier, particularly if you're if you're in one southern state trying to get information in, in another southern state. I think too, again, not being unique to the South, but at all levels of government, the the mechanisms for transparency tend to be the less fun, the least funded and the least resourced ones. So that you know, you have all of these people doing X thing, but even at the federal level, like it's like an afterthought uh, as to getting information out uh, to, to people. So you don't have that many people doing it. You may have people doing it on their own time or splitting several other duties to do that. Then I think there's there's education on our parts uh, too about using FOIA because as as journalists we don't use it enough, uh, and I don't think we most of the time I, I would say we don't use it effectively. I think we use it defensively rather than being offensive with it, and that is, you know. I preach that we file all the time for mm -hmm. things, particularly, you know, I don't have beat reporters, but I stress to the beat reporters that you file all the time because, you know, by the time something happens and then you file the FOIA for it, you're going to get that six months later, a year later, mm -hmm. right? But if you do this proactively, uh, then you get you know, better stories and then the community is better informed because you're getting things before it's actually in the news. And so, and I, I think it's just little tools and techniques um, that that we teach and I have, I'm happy to share mm -hmm. like some um, tip sheets and things that we put together on that we call being more uh, proactive or, or being offensive with, mm -hmm. with Ford. Yeah. Say, uh, Mara, what about you? I mean, because you have a group that's working under uh, several several different states. So I know you're working with different um, different laws. How, how do y'all navigate that? Well, we have to have a representative in Tennessee who's willing uh, to uh, <laughs> file all our FOIAs for us, which is delightful. Um, and it's a large ask because these FOIAs often take so much negotiating back and forth. And you're saying, they come back with $5,000 price tags that we're not going to pay. And then is it real? How much reporting do we have to do to figure out if they're even like being real about that cost, if the scope of what we're talking about is that large, but it's all, you know, they just don't want to do the work. And a lot of times it's not because they're trying to hide records, although sometimes that's the case. A lot of times it's because these are extremely understaffed, under-resourced departments that don't have enough people to do this. They, they're, you know, by law, they're supposed to give the work to the lowest paid person by hour who can do the work of gathering the records for you. But, you know, and, and in times of COVID, when you're losing workers in all types of different 
um, government agencies, it's become a real increasing problem. And then when we're doing projects where we're filing FOIA simultaneously for similar information in four states, the amount of upkeep on just the FOIAs is like a part-time job itself. So it, it is tricky and you have to sort of, yeah, I'm a fan of what Ron is saying, get those FOIAs out as early as possible or, or even anticipating what can come. Um, but on the other hand, you know, sometimes it just takes a substantial amount of work to even understand what the FOIA is asking for. And that's, um, you know, consider about a legwork. It's so many phone calls and uh, that's a luxury to have that time to do that for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joe, how about you? I know you're working on, um, you just mentioned across several states too. How about you for you personally managing that? Uh, well, personally managing it like most people do, I have a spreadsheet of all the FOIA uh, requests I have out and, tr and track that and, and, and try to be really disciplined and keep on top of that because there's a lot of them. Um, and one of the obstacles I see is that it, as you know, Ron says it takes six months, it takes a year sometimes or more. I've got a couple FOIAs out, uh, one with the FBI that's two and a half years, it was supposed to be given to me a year. <laughs> A year and a half ago, and they pleaded COVID. But um, is that I think we have an obligation to keep on top of all these. I think there is this game of uh, let's just make it so long and make it so difficult that they'll just go away. And that's a real problem. And the problem is a mentor of mine described it as this you know, you got to keep the dog off the sofa. If you let the dog get up on the sofa and um, and like it, it's, it sleeps there and it's, it's his sofa. It's like, no, you got to, these, these public officials, when they, they've got to obey the law, these are public records law, these are FOIA laws, and we got to keep on top of them yeah. and keep the dog off the sofa. Well, that's so good. Eminently quotable there, Jeff. Kate, I'd love to hear from you because, you know, we at, at CPP were involved in, um, pushing for public records. Right now we're still in a, um, I, would, I would call it a negotiation with several state agencies over COVID related um, information. But Kate, you've led, you've led that, but you've also worked at the very, very local, hyper-local level in trying to get public records and can speak to, to that too. What do you think? Uh, I think it really varies among departments, uh, among counties, among different agencies. Like right now, I have records requests out with more than a dozen police departments in a specific part of the state uh, for incident reports. And I swear every single one has fulfilled that differently. One of them, like they're usually two page reports. One of them just came back to me a couple days ago with only one of the two pages for all of their incident reports for the ones I'm looking for. Um, another one basically like redacted every single detail. So it's basically like handing me like 30 white sheets of, you know, records that I can't see. Um, so basically I have to kick the dog off the sofa, you know, all the time with these police departments and four of them still haven't responded to me yet. So, you know, you just got to build into your schedule, uh, having to file these records requests constantly today. I'm filing 17 with, uh, multiple school districts across the state for as part of our North, uh, North Carolina watchdog reporting network uh, for some stories that we're doing related to the pandemic. So, um, you know, it's just, I, I always try to file records requests often early, be very proactive before things become an issue, um, try to understand which of the agencies are gonna give you the most pushback and try to follow up with them as much as possible compared to the other ones. Yeah, great point. And, you know, talking about police, let, let's move to kind of acknowledging what's happening in the world today. COVID, um, you know, pushes for police accountability, um, calls for racial justice, um, empowering marginalized communities and people in our reporting. I'd love for y'all to kind of reflect about, you know, the reckoning that's happening across the region and frankly, the nation with regards to COVID testing, masking, um, you know, as I said, police accountability and transparency. What are you doing differently now than you were doing in the before times, as it were, you know, the end of 2019? Um, Mari, you, you talked a little bit about this in terms of why you got involved in investigative reporting and building trust in community. Uh, would, would you, would you kind of lead us off in that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that the communities, to the benefit of the communities, are getting more organized over the course of at least my career, not to say there wasn't fabulous organization efforts that certainly predate me, but, um, and I think that the power of social media has really, I mean, it has changed so much about journalism. It has also changed a lot about the dissemination of information early in a, um, uh, an instance of could be police brutality or any number of things, but um, doing work now in which social media is a, is a tool, but sometimes also an impediment um, is, is really interesting and really tricky. And I'm like old enough and was a journalist for many years before there was such a thing as social media. And it's, it's hard to re almost remember that time. And when I think about um, how, in some, again, in some ways it was much more difficult to find people because you had to really be on the ground all the time in communities looking for people who fit like a specific, um, you know, they were, they were like some kind of harm was inflicted upon them. And mm -hmm. now you can go on Twitter and find somebody like that. And it's, it's, very, it's a very different kind of work that we do. Um, not to say we're not on the ground in communities as well, but I find that um, marginalized communities are, are not less marginalized by like systemic L's, but they're, they're less, their voices are less um, stifled than, than before. And you know, that's, that's an interesting phenomenon uh, that has changed our work. Yeah. Joe, how about you? Because, you know, talk a little bit about the purpose of the Marshall Project. This partially reflects just like the whole mission of your organization, right? Yeah, uh, we were started with the mission uh, that uh, this is back in 2012, 13, when we were being formed, that everyone agrees that the criminal justice system is screwed up. Uh, whether you're on the right, left, middle, white, black, whatever, young, old, that everyone would agree uh, it's not working well. And so our mission is just to report on it and make things more transparent. And uh, I think it's it's a challenge, it's a really challenging uh, world to report in. For example, we see so much pushback now after uh, you know Black Lives Matters making uh, changing the conversation and then it all of a sudden gets turned around. Uh, oh, they want to defund the police, and so they be. You have these meta debates where the language is um, just doesn't reflect what actually people are saying or what's going on on the ground. And I think that that is that's that's really challenging. Um, one thing that it, uh, just a quick story about three stories I did in Mississippi and the difficulty sometimes of like, how are you going to have impact? We did a story on a private prison that we definitively had the receipts on that it was run by gangs because an internal audit, the warden admitted that he's letting gangs run the prison because they're so short staffed. Well, the place is a hell hole. Uh, the violence is, is awful. And we didn't get much of a reaction to this. And so then we thought, well, the short staffing also makes it really dangerous for guards and correctional officers and the people who work in these facilities. Oftentimes, uh, many of them, many of them, majority of these prisons, uh, Mississippi are staffed by single moms. And so let's write about the effect this has on the staff there who are doing our dirty work inside of prisons, the public's dirty work, and not much reaction on that. And then we finally got a little bit of a, uh, a bite when we wrote about how the private prison company was short staffing, making it more dangerous to staff, more dangerous to incarcerated people and more money for them because they were getting paid for all these ghost workers who weren't showing up for work. And finally, when it came around to money and taxpayer money, the auditor jumps in, the commissioner recently closed, took over control of one of these prisons. But, you know, that's a frustration that uh, the, the impact on humans inside these facilities doesn't get a toehold. But when we start talking about tax dollars, something happens. And that's, that's more of me just voicing a frustration. Yeah. Yeah, Kate, I'm sure you have some things to say about the related and covering jails. Yeah. Um... 
you know, there's one particular county that I focused on very early in my career here in North Carolina, and that's Cherokee County. And um, it's, it's really tough writing about people who are in jail, because a lot of the times, I don't think that the general public realizes, you know, these are people too, like they may have committed a crime. And a lot of time in jails, you haven't actually been convicted yet. In this country, you're considered innocent until proven guilty. And a lot of people who are in jail, they haven't even faced trial yet. And so you write about these deplorable conditions in a jail and they don't realize like there, but for the grace of God, go I or my relative. I mean, I've had relatives who've been in jail. I've had loved ones who've been in jail. I mean, maybe they had a DUI or something and it's not that uncommon for people to know other people who've been in jail and the lack of empathy, I think, for jail conditions is, you know, possibly because folks aren't familiar with, you know, what exactly the purpose of a jail is and how the taxpayer money and accountability is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Ron, I'm kind of curious about uh, what's changed for you since 2019. And of course, you're a co-founder of the IDB Wells Society. And so partially, um, that's a really exciting opportunity in terms of, you know, encouraging people of color to be investigative journalists, but I don't want to put that, you know, in your, as if that's, that's the answer, but I think it's, it's a significant answer. Um, so yeah, what's changed for you since the before times? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, obviously we're all working from home or maybe more accurately to say we're all living at work. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I think, um, you know, that's the big, big thing. And, and then trying to coordinate teams of people, which in some ways for me is not that much different because I have people around the world. So it's kind of the same. So it wasn't that big of a shift for, for a large part of, of the team. Um, but in terms of of this this reckoning that that you, that you talked about, I think there's there's several things that that have uh, that's significant for investigative reporting, right? And I think people um, like Wesley Lowry, uh, who's at 60 Minutes now, formerly of the uh, the Washington Post, is at sort of at the forefront of this, and that uh, the the believability of police departments, because at one point you know, we would all kind of report police issued a statement, this is what happened, and we would all kind of report that, right? Because it's an official statement from the police department. And I think now there is uh, news organizations, although it's still widely done, but there's more skepticism now because we see a statement and then we'll see the video later. And then it's like, well, wait a minute, they don't match up. And so I think there's more skepticism of that and that actually more uh, people are taking that as critical as they do any other types of things. So I think that that's, that's a, you know, a major issue. And we're talking about policing uh, in ways that are different now. Um, I know the, uh, one of the things that, that I thought was really interesting it, it, it was that the Marshall Project did a piece about policing in rural areas, because I feel like that is something that we never really talk about in the shootings that happen in rural areas, right? Because right. there probably isn't video and you you don't get the, the same kind of outrage that you do when somebody gets shot in an urban area because there's video, there's a lot of eyewitnesses and things like that. So I thought, you know, those kinds of things are, are like, what we are grappling with with now, and there's more of a conversation uh, around it, uh, and just in terms of, of of like within our own industry, as you mentioned, you know, I'm a co-founder of the IDB Well Society, and you know, we we want to diversify um, the the ranks of investigative journalism because we think that it's essential. It's not new. Uh, in that there's been, you know, people of color doing investigative reporting that's been mm -hmm. happening forever. So it's not new. It's just that they haven't been given the opportunities to do uh, that at, at, at mainstream organizations. Um, and then one of the other things uh, that I'd like to point out, too, and I think we, we, we're grappling with, with this, too, is what actually does diversity and inclusion mean, right? Uh, because 
you know, I've, one of the things that, that to me is like somebody's taking their fingers and scratching on a chalkboard is when I hear the words like diversity hires, you know, it's like, what does that mean actually? And, and, but diversity is a lot of things. And I think we need to be specific about what we're talking about, but I also think we need to be, to really understand that when you're hiring, like if you are hiring me, right? You're not just getting the black dude, right? You're like you're also getting a vet, yeah. you know, of the Marine Corps. You're also getting someone who grew up in a rural area who went hunting and fishing. Okay, the hunting thing, I cried when my dad shot a deer, it wasn't good. So <laughs> should probably scratch that off the list. But, you know, I did fishing and, and stuff like that. Um, it, so diversity is not just looking at like, okay, this person gives me this, this, this is a Latino. And, and so I'm getting that, but you're getting a lot more, you know, I'm a musician, you know, I, there's lots of other things that are, that are, that are there that I think that we, as our own looking internally in our own industry, that we are grappling with sort of post uh, or in the midst of, of the, the, the COVID area, era rather, that came out of a lot of things around the, the George Floyd uh, uh, protest and, and just, um, but even that existed before that, I think that was just sort of the catalyst for us to, to really focus in uh, on that. And it's given people an opportunity to, to now see what's being, uh, what was being said for, for like decades. Yeah. Yeah. And to that end, I mean, there's a lot of people on, on this call who are not journalists, but certainly support and want to see investigative journalism in their communities. So there's a lot of questions about kind of the, um, the quote unquote decline of local media, um, what can people do to help who aren't journalists, right? Um, the, there's a great question that came in. For those of us in local journalism deserts or in rural areas where local journalism is deteriorating or in poor quality, what can we do to hold power accountable? You know, relatedly, there's a question about um, reporters who aren't trained in investigative reporting or how to ask some of those accountability questions. <laughs> um, what do you all see, especially in the era of misinformation? Um, but and that, these are big questions, and I, I swear, if we if all of us had the answers, we'd be bajillionaires at this point. But um, but from your point of view, what what can what can people do in in news deserts and rural communities um, and very hyper local news organizations to um, to to do this kind of reporting? So if I could just take a stab at that, if you don't. Yeah, mind. please, Ron. At least don't please. mind. So I, I think that um, because where I'm from, <clears throat> there, the nearest daily paper is like 25 miles away. Mm -hmm. um, so there is no media there. And then on the other side in the county in Alabama, uh, in that entire county, there is no daily newspaper. There's, a, there's, there's like a weekly newspaper. Right. And I suspect it's, it's like that in, in a lot of areas. But I think what publications like that need to do is pick your spots, right? You are not gonna be able to cover every single little thing that is popping up. So you need to pick your spots, pick what you're gonna focus on and then go and focus on it. If that's gonna be local government, go in all in on that and, and reorient your reporters to that's what we're gonna focus on. You know, especially as we get fewer and re fewer resources at, at some of these places, that's what's going to have to happen. Secondly, I think there are uh, organizations like yourself, um, where you have a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations and ProPublica expanding into the in region and Marshall Projects having people in the region. So I think that that takes up some of, of, of that. But I do think we have to realize it in these little areas that... Um, <clears throat> With, with few resources and, and fewer reporters. Because, you know, as, as Joe mentioned up front here is that I think we tend to think of investigative reporting as this big, you know, 3000 word piece, you know, 
that's um, you know four parts of everything. But you have to remember that the, the, the most famous investigative example of investigative reporting in the history of American journalism is Watergate. And that was not a series. It was a series of stories that was done over a number of years. And okay. some of those stories, 800 words, 1,000 words, you know. So it, it investigative reporting doesn't have to be like these, these ginormous takeouts. One of the most impactful stories that I ever did was about 600 words. Mm. You know, and it got more attention than, than a, a, a good bit of things that I've done since then. Mm -hmm. But it, so I think we have to reorient ourselves into what does it mean to provide watchdog reporting to the communities that we cover, given the times that we're in and also given the resources that we have. Mm -hmm. Kate, Mara, Joe? Um, I have something for the, you know, the news desert is, as we all know, is a real problem that mm -hmm. we're, we're facing here in America. And there's large swaths of the country where there's just not much reporting going on. But if you're, uh, if you're in a hyper local or a, a small paper, I think one of the questions to be asking all the time is when you're talking oh, with people, it's like, what bothers you or what's not what what is a problem in your community that you think is not right and just to be to be asking that what keeps you when you wake up in the middle of the night what keeps you awake you know what are the what are the things that are you're concerned about and just um not not all of them are going to turn into stories but eventually you're going to get people telling you about something that ain't right and then how do you know that you know and who do i see about it and all those great questions that Wilford Brimley asked in the final scene of um, Absence of Malice. Just go through those questions with people and um, maybe you'll get somewhere. Right. I mean, there's no doubt fewer news gatherers, not just in rural areas, but even in sort of like small to mid size and even larger cities. And I think about where I got my start at the Macon Telegraph. I worked at the Warner Robins Bureau when I got there and that bureau then is probably had more people than work at the entire publication now, like mm -hmm. 20 plus years later. And so, you know, I think, but there's also opportunities. They're never going to replace what was lost, but there's opportunities to partner with other publications. I find that there is much less of a sense of competition, not that it doesn't exist, but much less of that and much more of a willingness to pool resources on topics that are the most important. Um, I am in a region that has seen uh, new, not just ProPublica, um, Canopy, which is a community um, focused nonprofit that moves through d different sort of um, uh, underserved communities in Atlanta. And by underserved, I mean underserved by media and empowers people in those neighborhoods to tell their own stories, the stories that are most important to them, not what somebody yeah. who comes into those communities thinks might be important. There's um, a new, uh, nonprofit Capital B that is now in Atlanta. I mean, there's there's much more coming to these areas in the form of more niche or nonprofit opportunities. And I think all of those places are interested in what communities have to say and what they deem important. And I, I mean, as much as um, relationships can be formed with both, you know, um, the news gatherers who remain and also with just the members of the community who have important topics they think are worthy of exploration um there are there is there are some signs of some hope mm -hmm. well you kate do you have anything to add well i think the other panelists covered covered it really well um you know as, as mara said you're not going to replace what was lost the uh the financial model for journalism mostly relied on advertising and not subscribers and when you're talking about a town of like four to five hundred people um, even the advertising for a, a town that size, you know, probably wasn't enough to sustain anything more than a weekly of that. And so um, really, you know, approaching things like Joe's talking about with empathy and curiosity and just being willing to listen to people, I think is um, really a, a skill that journalists should learn everywhere. Um, folks uh, in rural communities, uh, you know, might want to consider reaching out to a journalist at a nonprofit that doesn't necessarily cover a geographic area to point out the wrongs that are happening in their communities as well. 
I think that's a great place to end just recognizing the time um, there's so many amazing questions that you all asked and there's some questions in the chat that i didn't ask specifically but i hope i think a lot of y'all have even addressed them during in the course of just naturally in the course of your answers about tips about what rural communities can do how you can connect with uh, journalists i don't want to say this for everybody on the panel, but I certainly know Kate and I, um, and I would venture to guess Joe, Mara, and, and Ron would love to hear from y'all about stories that, that you have, and also really view us as resources um, to help connect you, if we can't do it, to help connect you to someone who can in your own community. Um, and if you're a journalist and, and have um, issues that you're facing or want to know how to do something, how to write that FOIA request, how to write that local public records request, what your, you know, what the laws are around going to court and recording things and things like that. It does change community to community and often state to state or always state to state. So, um, you know, finding that local um, journalist that can help you navigate that too, I think is, is, is really good. Everybody's super Super busy too. So sometimes I, I want to just say that sometimes it takes us a while to get back to people. And that's not a personal thing. If you don't view that, sometimes it's just a sheer, you know, um, just the time it takes. So I, I just want to say that. I always like to tell people that about journalists. Um, so with that, I just want to acknowledge and thank all of you for participating today. Ron, Mara, Joe, Kate, I love talking to y'all. We could do this all, all day, I'm sure. Um, and there's really a lot of good questions that we didn't get to cover, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but I certainly want to appreciate all of you for coming, um, participating in this investigative reporting panel, and the participants for your great questions and your interest and your support, truthfully, is, is really amazing. Um, so with that, I just want to remind y'all that on September 22nd, we're going to have another um, virtual conversation. It's about climate change in the North Carolina coast and how it's impacting fishing and fisheries. Um, and certainly if you all, you know, one thing these folks didn't say is that one thing you can do is to, um, you know, become a member and support local journalists and what, whoever you find valuable in your community. Certainly if y'all want to become a member of Carolina Public Press, we would love that. We certainly appreciate that. It helps make casework possible um, and, and her colleagues and our colleagues, um, the Marshall Project, ProPublica, and with Ron, IDB Wells, and the Associated Press. So I really want to thank all of you. Thanks again to Asheville Buckham Technical Community College for sponsoring this series, um, or part of the series, um, this event, certainly. Thank you again to our panelists. Um, we will be sending out the recording to all of you afterwards and we'll also have it at carolinapublicpress.org so you all can view it again or share it um and if you have any requests for information or future panels please let us know i'd really like to to know that um, so again on behalf of everyone at carolina public press and angie newsome thanks so much for joining us and have a wonderful day thanks everyone